Next up, we have Marianne Williamson, and she was a former Democratic candidate for president. She is a former, she's like Oprah's, like, I don't even know what or something, but she does like spiritual stuff for, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what her background is. I just know that it's something spiritual and for like some typically hired by wealthier people, but she's got a good analysis on a lot of uh, left-wing issues. I don't totally agree with her on policy. I prefer Bernie's policies. I supported Bernie, Bernie in the primary, but I will say that on a personality level and just sort of strategy and rhetoric level, I like Marianne Williamson more than I like anyone like post Biden nomination and such. Like she's been really good about like just from all the, the nominees, I should say. So I like her rhetoric and she's really critical of the Democratic Party while still saying, she, you know, I'm going to vote in the Democratic Party this year, but she's supporting movements like this and really pushing on the left. So I am totally a fan of Marianne Williamson. I don't think that she gets enough credit. I think people shit on her unfairly. And, you know, Cornell West, we're going to hear from Cornell West. And I just, I want you to, it, when you listen to her, keep try to keep her speech in mind and then compare to Cornell West. I saw somebody like, I saw Nico House tweet out, like saying that Marianne Williamson, like, you know, saying that she was like get, being wrong on purpose and that, uh, in that she was just making the taking the easy choice of like, um, you know, the this easy binary choice that she was trying to, uh, you know, make instead of the difficult principle choice. And I don't like that framing at all. I think it's really condescending and demeaning. And just like, why do you have to talk like that? As if we know that we're right, we're just one hundred percent sure that we're right, and there's no room for us to potentially be wrong about this or something. And also just like not giving your allies much as you should give your enemies more credit you know in 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 and not underestimate your enemies definitely don't underestimate your allies either and like don't sell them short and give them the benefit of the doubt i trust that she's a sincere person who honestly believes that her strategy you know what she'll tell you about here is what she believes is best for the country i don't doubt that and so i think that she's being sincere i think she's being genuine and I think we agree on most of the issues. And so I'm not going to push away somebody like Marianne Williamson. And I also think that Cornell West speaks in a very similar manner, but he doesn't catch a lot of shit for it. And I think that there's something to say about that. Like, I, I get it. They give her, they like, you know, white women, like it's sort of seen as like this old yoga mom, kind of like, oh, airy, whatever. Like, but like she speaks about love and she gets criticized. And then Cornell West speaks about love, you know, and like radical love. And everybody just eats it up, including me. And I love it. And I, but I also respect Marianne Williamson when she talks about it. And I think that it's, but I have seen, um, I have seen Michael Brooks criticize and say that sometimes he feels like Marianne Williamson. He felt, he felt like Marianne Williamson maybe talk about love, spoke about love without recognizing also like tying it to power and tying love to power. And he has this great quote, Michael Brooks, from when he was actually speaking alongside Cornell West at Harvard. And he talked, and it was a quote from MLK that he was referencing, but he said something, it's like something along the lines of like, love, um, love, you know, uh, power without love is like brutal or something like that. And like, love without power is is anemic and like ineffective or something like that so i'm paraphrasing and i'm doing a really poor job at it but it's just this idea of like power without love or love without power we need both right you need both power and love and to actually have a and we on the left need to recognize that recognize there there's a a gap here where you know there's a void of spirituality in the country and because we're becoming more secular than ever and people are just non-religious i'm one of them i'm not religious and so there's a there's a void there to be filled people got something from religion that we have to recognize on the left and there is a, a spirituality does hold some value and we have to recognize that and like if we're gonna be a popular mainstream movement we're gonna have to bring in people that are christian and 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 other religion, you know, any whatever, you know, Muslim, whatever, we have to bring in religious people into our fold. And we can't be like, shitting on like, you know, religious folks and saying, Oh, we're right, because we're atheists, and they're wrong. And like, oh, that kind of attitude doesn't doesn't help anyone. And we have to recognize also the importance of spirituality and the power behind that. And that messaging and also not 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 just um, seed, seed power to the to the right in that realm and we have to try to take control of it on the left and try to control that narrative and also offer something up in the way of a, a spirituality in our movement as well and so that's something that M michael brooks really 
was beginning to focus on more and more towards the end of his life and something that I'd like to hopefully carry forward in, in trying to you know carry forward a small part of his legacy as well. Okay. So next up, Marianne Williamson, Williamson. She was a presidential, Democratic presidential nominee. With what happened in trickle-down economics, led by the guys from Ch University of Chicago, although interestingly enough, the main articulator of trickle-down economics, a man named Milton Friedman, himself said, but none of this will work without a universal basic income. Well, the people who promulgated trickle-down economics left that part out, of course. And they said that the US corporation should have no moral or ethical responsibility to people or to planet. Because you see, before then, the social consensus was that it should. You see, before then, it's not like America was ever all good. But I remember a time when the social consensus was that at least we should try. With trickle-down economics, the idea was that all the responsibility of the corporation was would be the short-term profits for the stockholder class and all other stakeholders, the workers, eh, the, the earth itself, eh, the community and the environment and eh, everything was to accrue to the stockholders. And then they would make so much money that all that money would trickle down and it would lift all boats. After 40 years, we know what happened. It did not lift all boats. As a matter of fact, it left millions of people without even a life vest. It created such a massive transfer of wealth into the hands of 1% as to have completely devastated the middle class in this country. And what it created was a new aristocracy in this country. We have reverted. Just like in 1776, we chose democracy over aristocracy, we have reverted to aristocracy. It is now a corporate aristocracy. It is health insurance companies. It is big pharmaceutical companies. It is big oil. It is food companies. It is chemical companies. It is the National Rifle Association, uh, gun manufacturers. And of course, it is the military industrial complex. In 1776, there were enough people who were willing to stand up to aristocracy. And as I said before, it's our turn. Now, if you look at the great social justice movements in our history, such as abolition, such as women's suffrage, third parties were extremely important. Abolition did not emerge from a major party. It emerged from the abolitionist party. Women's suffrage did not emerge from a major political party. It emerged from the women's party. Social security did not emerge from a major party. It emerged from the Socialist Party. But I say that in complete support of Ryan and Nick in saying that they don't want to think of this as a third party. They want it to be a major party. And I agree with everyone here in saying that if the Democrats don't feel that there's a real alternative to their corporatist agenda, then at this point with everything we've been through, with what happened to Bernie in 16, what happened to Bernie this year, and to be honest, what happened to me? I've been there. I know it from the inside. The Republican Party has been so taken over by a corporatist agenda, they don't even pretend that they're not. But the Democratic Party is very interesting, isn't it? It sees all the suffering that is created by a corporatist agenda, and it does, in ways that it can, try to ameliorate the suffering on the periphery. But neither the Democratic Party, any more than the Republican Party, will actually challenge the underlying forces that make all that suffering inevitable. And so when it came to abolition, people knew it was simply time for the people to take it from here. When it came to women's suffrage, it was women who knew, no, we're gonna have to step in. When it came to civil rights, Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, it was time for the people to step in. And one more time, it is time for the people to step in. And that's why this party is important. Now I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. I'm definitely going to vote for Joe Biden. And as has been said here before, everybody has to vote their own conscience and other people have expressed their opinion about this race. Some people have said to me, oh, Marianne, you think he's gonna fix anything? No, actually, I don't think he's gonna fix anything, but I think he's going to give us a pause in the action because Donald Trump's policies, the state of this country right now, what Donald Trump has done to this country is Donald Trump holding back. You give him a second term, there will be nothing to hold him back. And I agree with Michelle Obama when she said, oh, you think it can't get any worse? Trust me, it can't. And just like I said a few minutes ago, I think we should all read up on our American history right now. It would be a good idea to read up about Germany in the 1930s.
and the 1940s. Yeah. So she said, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, a bunch of stuff to unpack there, really. I thought that her analysis of, you know, the state of the Democratic Party and Republican Party and country, I think that she was really pretty much spot on on the on our analysis and just what the ills of this society are right now and the, and the struggles that we have where we disagree and that's probably where there's more interesting things to discuss is about and that was a that was first off i think the point that she made in the beginning the very beginning of the clip the clip that the clip i showed the second time so the point that she made in the very beginning of the clip was that you know milton friedman supported a ubi because he said it was the only way that trickle down economics could work i just that should be a warning about universal basic income, right? Is that that, and that's why I'm not. I support it as like a stopgap, but I don't think that it is the 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 way that we should necessarily be looking at our future. And you, if you want to know my position on a universal basic income, Google Richard Wolf, universal basic income, and whatever he believes, that's what I believe. I mean, he he, he says, you know, essentially what I'm saying here, but way smarter uh, is that. It's an okay stopgap, but it is not, it should not be, it should be a means to an end, but not the end for us because a universal basic income in this system as it is currently structured only stands to prop up capitalism, right? If we create a universal basic income inside of a capitalist system, then that just means we're going to be getting money that we are going to spend back into a capitalist system, right? And it's just going to leave all of us with, you know, no sense of purpose or meaning in society, but just simply other than being consumers. And I don't think that consumption is, should be our, you know, our end goal. And that's not, human beings exist beyond consumption. And so we need to start to, you know, have a, 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 you know, we can't, we can't just fall back on UBI necessarily. We need to recognize the, some of the dangers of a UBI. If you, if you build a UBI in a, in a, capitalist system. Also, the type of UBI that Andrew Yang was talking about, not a major fan of that. His UBI required you to give up the other certain other social programs and social welfare programs. I do not think that that's the way to go. I think that you just simply have to add a UBI on top of all the other existing social welfare programs and then allow people to naturally move away from those other programs as they are, you know, see fit and are comfortable to and, and capable of moving beyond those those uh, other supports. So you can't just, you can't just give people a universal basic income. If you do that, what you're going to do is you're going to give a, a stimulus to all the people that are already all set that don't need social welfare programs. And for everybody already currently on social welfare programs, which are the, the, you know, most marginalized peoples, those folks are going to have to pick and choose. Oh, do I need that? Um, you know, whatever, care, personal caregiver, you know, benefit or, you know, welfare program or whatever. And, or do I need this universal basic income? Well, if you're already, if, if, if the benefits, the social welfare benefits you're already receiving are say, you know, total out to $1,500 a month, it's only a difference of about, if you give up all of that and you get 2000 in its place, one, you know, sometimes, you know, then you're now in charge of having to manage all of it yourself. But then on, on top of that, then you are you're, you're it's only about a five hundred dollar gain right but for somebody that's not on any social welfare programs which are going to be middle class people people that are well off right they're all going to get the full two thousand dollars to use because they're not going to have to give up any social welfare program so that kind of ubi is just garbage to me that's i don't i want no part of that kind of ubi a ubi that i would look at would be one that simply sits on top of all the other existing social welfare programs and even then, and then would be like something like two thousand dollars a month to every single adult over the age of sixteen. I think that that's a fair amount, and we just see that that's sort of needed right now, and just to keep the economy propped up as it is. And so, uh, but just something that note: if when the when the most staunchest capitalists are in favor of a program, we should certainly double check it and just reevaluate our support for something like that. Again, just making sure that we're being careful. I'm not saying don't support UBI or that UBI is bad. I'm simply saying we have to be cognizant of our support for it and the, the pitfalls and the traps that we could fall into. We got to try to have foresight so we don't let other people get, you know, suffer or be damaged by a policy we think is going to improve people's lives. We should be, be try to be certain about that. And so that was fine. The part that I really disagree with her, that the part that I disagree with her about is the bit at the end that she said 
She says that she's voting for Biden, which is fine, you know, whatever. Um, she says she's voting for Biden. She was honest about it. She said he won't fix anything, quote, he won't fix anything. She says she doesn't believe that. She's not like naive or anything like that. She doesn't believe that Biden is going to fix anything. She says she simply believes that he will pause the situation as it is. Um, and I, the, the the she also talked about, she also used the rhetoric of saying like that, for one, she said like, she she said that Trump was like that, you know, she quoted Michelle Obama and the, you know, it can get worse. You know, if you think it can't get worse, uh, it can. And that whole thing is like, yeah, of course, it, it, I don't think. Yeah, of course, I, I don't believe that it can't. I'm not one of these people who don't think it can get worse. I know it can get worse. I'm That's my biggest issue and my concern with voting for Joe Biden, particularly like or or Donald Trump, is that it it could lead to things just getting worse. And I'm that's my that's my estimate is that a Joe Biden presidency is going to empower Kamala Harris and she is going to be a formidable opponent now in 2024 for any actual progressive that wants to you know, challenge her. And all of a sudden she's going to be getting ascended into the, you know, she's just going to be getting propped up and, 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 and ascended into the like, you know, nomination. And so we have to be really careful because by empowering Joe Biden, we are empowering his vice president and the next neoliberal era and regime. And so I always have to weigh those two things, this idea of like pausing versus this idea of like, well, maybe we're just not just deferring harm, but we're not just reducing harm, but we're simply deferring it with interest. And it's going to be even worse the next time around. Like I, I serious, I don't think that some of these people believe that it can get worse because I don't think that some of these people, I don't think they think that there's anything worse than Trump. I think that some folks, liberals mostly believe that there's nothing worse than Trump, that Trump is just the worst it can get. And I see examples right now that are worse than Trump right now today, Tom Cotton, worse than Trump, Tucker Carlson, worse than Trump. Even Mike Pence is worse than Trump because these people have all the same disgusting ideology as Donald Trump. But they're smart enough to actually implement the policies and they're not dumb enough to just like shout it out or tweet about like these th their shit and get that, you know, create like challenges in court against his policies. And and so I, I, I'm I concerned about empowering the next neoliberal and that's what I'm wrestling with. And that's what I'm I just can't bring myself to vote for Joe Biden because I can't I don't want to feel complicit anymore. I genuinely believe that when you vote for a politician, you do have to own Whatever they do, you own it. You help if you support them, if you vote for them, if you vote them in, I think in some way you got to own what they do. And so I don't want to own that. I don't want to own that. And so I want to at least say, listen, I, I cast my vote. If everybody else, if all the other Democratic voters decided to do what I did, we'd have got a Green Party candidate who believes in Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, fight for 15, legalizing cannabis, um, you know, housing as a human right. Like these are things that like, Howie Hawkins, Angela Walker, they have my vote because they support the policies that I believe in. They have they hold the same values and they they actually represent those values. And so that's where I am. Now, she also like said like, okay, um, you know, she also said that this she compared she's like using the rhetoric of like Trump comparing them to Hitler and Nazi Germany. And I just think that that's a bit reckless, to be honest. I don't, we got four years of it, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't Hitler Germany. Let's be real. It's not that. It's not that. I mean, there's some comparisons to be made. You know, we definitely have concentration camps for people at our Southern border. There are concentration camps, nothing on the scale. I mean, it's terrible and it's awful. It's awful and it's horrific and I hate it. And I want to do everything I can to stop it. But Let's not be, you know, let's not ex over exaggerate where, where it's unnecessary because then we lose credibility when we do things like that. And so I don't, I don't think that she's, I don't think that Trump is on a scale of Hitler. And I also don't think Trump is some mastermind or some dude with some immense patience who has been holding back for four years. And we're going to see the real Trump and what he really wanted to do for the next four years. Like, let's not give this moron credit that he doesn't deserve. He's not a super genius. He's not a genius. He's not even a, a an intelligent human being. And he's not fully cognitively, you know, uh, he doesn't have his full cognitive capacity, I think, any longer. Same for Joe Biden. And so let's just not let's not lie about that. Let's not exaggerate that either, because then that gets us to a position where we're where we're just over. We're, 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 we're exaggerating the real dangers there. And it's not it's not based in reality, in my opinion. I, let's see who's right. Right. If Donald Trump wins, which Joe Biden is opening up the door for Donald Trump to win this next election based on recent polling, 
Joe Biden is doing worse than Hillary Clinton at this very point in the election. Joe Biden is doing worse than Hillary Clinton in the battleground states. So, and the polls keep tightening and tightening and tightening. Every poll that comes out, they got the RNC, got a bump. There was no, no bump out of the DNC because it was completely uninspirational. And then, and just filled with platitudes and nonsense. Um, and, and then you get the, you know, and the RNC is just total garbage, but so I just think, you know, be careful with like giving Trump more credit than he deserves. He's nobody's mastermind. He's no like secret genius, you know, plotting and planning what he's going to do next. And mm, yeah, he's just waited four years. And then he's, we're going to see the real Trump come out in, after four years. He's been really holding back. I, nothing that he's done has looked like holding back in any way. Let's say that first off. None of this shit looks like holding back to me. And then on top of that, it's also like, I just don't think he's smart enough to do that. I don't think he's smart enough that he was like, oh, I'm going to wait and I'm going to play this long con game. When first off, he didn't even, I don't think he even thought he was going to win that election. I don't think anybody in this country thought that that dude was going to win this election, including him. I mean, except for a handful of people, you know, Michael Moore, Cenk Uger, a few people got that shit right. But most people, you know, I think Kyle Kalinske, most people, most people got it wrong. A few people, a handful of people got it right. And I wouldn't be surprised if like a Tim Black and, and, and folks like that knew Jordan Sharon and these kind of folks. I wish Jordan Sheridan got to speak at the People's Convention. I don't know why. why I wonder why Jordan Sheridan didn't get a spot or they, or if they didn't reach out to him or what. But I, he's the kind of person that I think would be great to speak at a, a, an event like this. So, yeah, um, I thought that, you know, it's fine. She's still voting for Biden. That's fine. You can hold that position. I like I appreciate that she's critical, but says she's still voting for him. Totally fine position. I just what I can't stand is the people that try to sell us this fake reality and try to lie to us you know i'm gonna piss on our leg and tell us it's raining where they're like oh no joe biden's wonderful and you like or like ava duvernay who came out after doing producing the movie and directing the movie 13th about 13th amendment and prison labor and slave labor and mass incarceration and then to turn around and be like no you cannot criticize i don't want to hear i don't care what you say i don't want to hear you criticize kamala harris like that's wild and not it's a it's out of touch with reality and, and insulting to the masses of people who are going to be substantively impacted. Uh, let me be real. Ava DuVernay herself will not be directly, you know, will not actually suffer under the hands of mass incarceration. She's not going to get arrested and thrown in jail. Like, let me be real. Like, she's uh, of a different class at this point. And, like, it's just not going to happen. And so I think these people just lose sight of – they they just miss the class element sometimes. And, and it pisses me off. It pisses me off. And so – but – I thought Marianne Williamson, other than that, I really liked her her, her speech. I, if you watch the whole thing, it's really good. It, I think it hits on a lot of concepts that we need to try to embrace a little bit more on the left and understand and appreciate. She has a great position on reparations. You should check her out on – she absolutely demolished, as we would say. Um, she demolished Dave Rubin on his show when they talked about reparations. Like Google Mary, – not right now, but after the, you're done watching the stream. Google Marianne Williamson – um, on Dave Rubin and oh my goodness, like, or like reparations and you will see, and she has a great, great stance. And I really respect her position and her understanding. She has a great reading of history and she is actually a great, like she has a great reading of history and she can really historicize these things very well. So shout out to Marianne Williamson. Thanks for watching Radical Democracy Podcast. I'm your host, Kamali Rose. Please like and share this video, subscribe to the channel and if it doesn't bother you, hit that bell below to receive notifications whenever we go live or launch a new video. Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. And if you can afford it, do me a huge favor and head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash radical democracy and throw me a few bucks. Whatever you can afford, it goes a long way and I will greatly appreciate it. It helps the channel to continue to exist and to grow. And I really appreciate the support. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon. All right. Peace. All right. That was a good one. That one's, that one's it.